Chapter One of the Time Traders by Andre Norton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Douglas Nelson. The Time Traders. Chapter One. To anyone who glanced casually inside the detention room the young man sitting there did not seem very formidable. In height he might have been a little above average, but not enough to make him noticeable. His brown hair was cropped conservatively. His unlined boy's face was not one to be remembered, unless one was observant enough to note those light gray eyes and catch a chilling, measuring expression showing now and then for an instant in their depths. Neatly and inconspicuously dressed, in this last quarter of the twentieth century his like was to be found on any street of the city ten floors below, to all outward appearances. But that other person under the protective coloring was so assiduously cultivated could touch heights of encased and controlled fury which Murdoch himself did not understand and was only just learning to use as a weapon against a world he had always found hostile. He was aware, though he gave no sign of it, that a guard was watching him. The cop on duty was an old hand. He probably expected some reaction other than passive acceptance from the prisoner. But he was not going to get it. The law had Ross sewed up tight this time. Why didn't they get about the business of shipping him off? Why had he had that afternoon session with the skull-thumper? Ross had been on the defensive then, and he had not liked it. He had given to the other's questions all the attention his shrewd mind could muster. But a faint, very faint apprehension still clung to the memory of that meeting. The door of the detention room opened. Ross did not turn his head, but the guard cleared his throat as if their hour of mutual silence had dried his vocal cords. "'On your feet, Murdoch. The judge wants to see you.' Ross rose smoothly, with every muscle under fluid control. It never paid to talk back, to allow any sign of defiance to show. He would go through the motions as if he were a bad little boy who had realized his errors. It was a meek and mild act that had paid off more than once in Ross's checkered past. So he faced the man seated behind the desk in the other room with an uncertain, diffident smile standing with boyish awkwardness, respectfully waiting for the other to speak first. Judge Ord Rawl. It was his rotten luck to pull old Eagle Beak on his case. Well, he would simply have to take it when the old boy dished it out. Not that he had to remain stuck with it later. You have a bad record, young man. Ross allowed his smile to fade. His shoulders slumped but under concealing lids his eyes showed an instant of cold defiance. "'Yes, sir,' he agreed in a voice carefully cultivated to shake convincingly about the edges. Then suddenly all Ross's pleasure in the skill of his act was wiped away. Judge Rawl was not alone. That blasted skull-thumper was sitting there, watching the prisoner with the same keenness he had shown the other day. A very bad record for the few years you have had to make it. Eaglebeak was staring at him, too, but without the same look of penetration, luckily for Ross. By rights, you should have been turned over to the new rehabilitation service. Ross froze inside. That was the treatment, icy rumors of which had spread throughout his particular world. For the second time since he had entered the room, his self-confidence was jarred. Then he clung with a degree of hope to the phrasing of that last sentence. "'Instead, I have been authorized to offer you a choice, Murdoch, one which I shall state, on the record, I do not in the least approve.' Ross's twinge of fear faded. If the judge didn't like it, there must be something in it to the advantage of Ross Murdoch. He'd grab it for sure." There is a government project in need of volunteers. It seems that you have tested out as possible material for this assignment. If you sign for it, the law will consider the time spent on it as part of your sentence. 
Thus you may aid the country which you have heretofore disgraced. And, if I refuse, I go to this rehabilitation. Is that right, sir? I certainly consider you a fit candidate for rehabilitation. Your record. He shuffled through the papers on his desk. I choose to volunteer for the project, sir. The judge snorted and pushed all the papers into a folder. He spoke to a man waiting in the shadows. Here, then, is your volunteer, Major. Ross bottled in his relief. He was over the first hump, and since his luck had held so far, he might be able to win all the way. The man Judge Rawl called Major moved into the light. At the first glance, Ross, to his hidden annoyance, found himself uneasy. To face up to Eaglebeak was all part of the game, but somehow he sensed one did not play such games with this man. Thank you, Your Honor. We will be on our way at once. This weather is not very promising. Before he realized what was happening, Ross found himself walking meekly to the door. He considered trying to give the Major the slip when they left the building, losing himself in a storm-darkened city. But they did not take the elevator downstairs. Instead, they climbed two or three flights up the emergency stairs. And, to his humiliation, Ross found himself panting and slowing, while the other man, who must have been a good dozen years his senior, showed no signs of discomfort. They came out into the snow on the roof, and the Major flashed a torch skyward, guiding in a dark shadow which touched down before them. A helicopter. For the first time, Ross began to doubt the wisdom of his choice. "'On your way, Murdoch,' the voice was impersonal enough, but that very impersonality got under one's skin. Bundled into the machine between the silent major and an equally quiet pilot in uniform, Ross was lifted over the city, whose ways he knew as well as he knew the lines on his own palm, into the unknown he was already beginning to regard dubiously. The lighted streets and buildings, their outlines softened by the soft wet snow, fell out of sight. Now they could mark the outer highways. Ross refused to ask any questions. He could take this silent treatment. He had taken a lot of tougher things in the past. The patches of light disappeared, and the country opened out. The plane banked. Ross, with all the familiar landmarks of his world gone, could not have said if they were headed north or south. But moments later, not even the thick curtain of snowflakes could blot out the pattern of red lights on the ground, and the helicopter settled down. Come on. For the second time Ross obeyed. He stood shivering, engulfed in a miniature blizzard. His clothing, protection enough in the city, did little good against the push of the wind. A hand gripped his upper arm, and he was drawn forward to a low building. A door banged and Ross and his companion came into a region of light and very welcome heat. Sit down, over there. Too bewildered to resent orders, Ross sat. There were other men in the room. One, wearing a queer suit of padded clothing, a bulbous headgear hooked over his arm, was reading a paper. The Major crossed to speak to him, and after they conferred for a moment, the Major beckoned Ross with a crooked finger. Ross trailed the officer into an inner room lined with lockers. From one of the lockers the Major pulled a suit like the pilot's, and began to measure it against Ross. "'All right,' he snapped. "'Climb into this. We have an all-night.' Ross climbed into the suit. As soon as he fastened the last zipper his companion jammed one of the domed helmets on his head. The pilot looked in the door. We'd better scramble, Calgarys, or we may be grounded for the duration." They hurried back to the flying field. If the helicopter had been a surprising mode of travel, this new machine was something straight out of the future. A needle-slim ship poised on fins, its sharp nose lifting vertically into the heavens. There was a scaffolding along one side, which the pilot scaled to enter the ship. Unwillingly, Ross climbed the same ladder and found that he must wedge himself in on his back, his knees hunched up almost under his chin. To make it worse, 
Cramped as those quarters were, he had to share them with the Major. A transparent hood snapped down and he was secured, sealing them in. During his short lifetime, Ross had often been afraid, bitterly afraid. He had fought to toughen his mind and body against such fears. But what he experienced now was no ordinary fear. It was panic so strong that it made him feel sick. To be shut in this small place with the knowledge that he had no control over his immediate future brought him face to face with every terror he had ever known, all of them combined into one horrible whole. How long does a nightmare last? A moment? An hour? Ross could not time his. But at last the weight of a giant hand clamped down on his chest, and he fought for breath until the world exploded about him. He came back to consciousness slowly. For a second he thought he was blind. Then he began to sort out one shade of grayish light from another. Finally Ross became aware that he no longer rested on his back, but was slumped in a seat. The world about him was rung with a vibration that beat in turn throughout his body. Ross Murdoch remained at liberty as long as he had because he was able to analyze the situation quickly. Seldom in the past five years had he been at a loss to deal with any challenging person or action. Now he was aware that he was on the defensive and was being kept there. He stared into the dark and thought hard and furiously. He was convinced that everything that was happening to him this day was designed with only one end in view, to shake his self-confidence and make him pliable. Why? Ross had an enduring belief in his own abilities, and he also possessed a kind of shrewd understanding seldom granted to one so young. He knew that, while Murdoch was important to Murdoch, he was none too important in the scheme of things as a whole. He had a record, a record so bad, that Rawl might easily have thrown the book at him. But it differed in one important way from that of many of his fellows. Until now he had been able to beat most of the raps. Ross believed this was largely because he had always worked alone and taken pains to plan a job in advance. Why now had Ross Murdoch become so important to someone that they would do all this to shake him? He was a volunteer for what? To be a guinea pig for some bug they wanted to learn how to kill cheaply and easily? They'd been in a big hurry to push him off base. Using the silent treatment, this rushing round in planes, they were really working to keep him groggy. So, all right, he'd give them a groggy boy all set up for their job, whatever it was. Only was his act good enough to fool the Major? Ross had a hunch that it might not be, and that really hurt. It was deep night now. Either they had flown out of the path of the storm, or were above it. There were stars shining through the cover of the cockpit, but no moon. Ross's formal education was sketchy, but in his own fashion he had acquired a range of knowledge which would have surprised many of the authorities who had had to deal with him. All the wealth of a big city library had been his to explore, and he had spent much time there, soaking up facts in many odd branches of learning. Facts were very useful things. On at least three occasions assorted scraps of knowledge had preserved Ross's freedom, once perhaps his life. Now he tried to fit together the scattered facts he knew about his present situation into some proper pattern. He was inside some new type of super-super atom jet, a machine so advanced in design that it would not have been used for anything that was not an important mission, which meant that Ross Murdoch had become necessary to someone somewhere. Knowing that fact should give him a slight edge in the future, and he might well need such an edge. He'd just have to wait, play dumb, and use his eyes and ears. At the rate they were shooting along, they ought to be out of the country in a couple of hours. Didn't the government have bases half over the world to keep the cold peace? Well, there was nothing for it. To be planted abroad someplace might interfere with plans for escape, but he'd handle that detail when he was forced to face it.
Then suddenly Ross was on his back once more, the giant hand digging into his chest and middle. This time there were no lights on the ground to guide them in. Ross had no intimation that they had reached their destination until they sat down with a jar which snapped his teeth together. The Major wriggled out, and Ross was able to stretch his cramped body. But the other's hand was already on his shoulder, urging him along. Ross crawled free and clung dizzily to a ladder-like disembarking structure. Below there were no lights, only an expanse of open snow. Men were moving across that blank area, gathering at the foot of the ladder. Ross was hungry and very tired. If the Major wanted to play games, he hoped that such action could wait until the next morning. In the meantime, he must learn where here was. If he had a chance to run, he wanted to know the surrounding territory. But that hand was on his arm, drawing him along toward a door that stood half open. As far as Ross could see, it led to the interior of a hillock of snow. Either the storm or men had done a very good cover-up job, and somehow Ross knew the camouflage was intentional. That was Ross's introduction to the base, and after his arrival his view of the installation was extremely limited. One day was spent in undergoing the most searching physical he had ever experienced and after the doctors had poked and pried, he was faced by a series of other tests no one bothered to explain. Thereafter, he was introduced to solitary, that is, confined to his own company in a cell-like room, with a bunk that was more comfortable than it looked, and an announcer in a corner of the ceiling. So far, he had been told exactly nothing, and so far he had asked no questions, stubbornly keeping up his end of what he believed to be a tug of wills. At the moment, safely alone and lying flat on his bunk, he eyed the announcer, a very dangerous young man and one who refused to yield an inch. "'Now hear this!' The voice transmitted through that grill was metallic, but its rasp held overtones of Kelgary's voice. Ross's lips tightened. He had explored every inch of the walls and knew that there was no trace of the door which had admitted him. With only his bare hands to work with, he could not break out, and his only clothes were the shirt, sturdy slacks, and a pair of soft-soled moccasins they had given to him. "'To identify!' droned the voice. Ross realized that he must have missed something, not that it mattered. He was almost determined not to play along any more. There was a click signifying that Kelgaris was through brain, but that customary silence did not close in again. Instead, Ross heard a clear, sweet trilling, which he vaguely associated with a bird. His acquaintance with all feathered life was limited to city sparrows and plump park pigeons, neither of which raised their voices in song, but surely those sounds were bird notes. Ross glanced from the mic in the ceiling to the opposite wall, and what he saw there made him sit up, with the instant response of an alerted fighter. For the wall was no longer there. Instead, there was a sharp slope of ground cutting down from peaks, where the dark green of fir trees ran close to the snow line. Patches of snow clung to the earth in sheltered places, and the scent of those pines was in Ross's nostrils, real as the wind touching him with its chill. He shivered as a howl sounded loudly and echoed, bearing the age-old warning of a wolf-pack, hungry and a hunt. Ross had never heard that sound before, but his human heritage subconsciously recognized it for what it was, death on four feet. Similarly, he was able to identify the gray shadow slinking about the nearest trees, and his hands balled into fists as he looked wildly about him for some weapon. The bunk was under him, and three of the four walls of the room enclosed him like a cave. But one of those gray skulkers had raised its head and was looking directly at him, its reddish eyes alight. Ross ripped the blanket off the bunk with a half-formed idea of snapping it at the animal when it sprang. Stiff-legged, the beast advanced, a guttural growl sounding deep in its throat. To Ross, the animal, larger than any dog he had ever seen and twice as vicious, was a monster. 
he had the blanket ready before he realized that the wolf was not watching him after all, and that his attention was focused on a point out of his line of vision. The wolf's muzzle wrinkled in a snarl, revealing long, yellow-white teeth. There was a singing twang, and the animal leaped into the air, fell back and rolled on the ground, biting despairingly at a shaft protruding from just behind its ribs. It howled again, and blood broke from its mouth. Ross was beyond surprise now. He pulled himself together and got up, to walk steadily toward the dying wolf, and he wasn't in the least amazed when his outstretched hands flattened against an unseen barrier. Slowly he swept his hands right and left, sure that he was touching the wall of his cell. Yet his eyes told him he was on a mountainside, and every sight, sound, and smell was making it real to him. Puzzled, he thought a moment, and then, finding an explanation that satisfied him, he nodded once and went back to sit at ease on his bunk. This must be some superior form of TV that included odors, the illusion of wind, and other fancy touches to make it more vivid. The total effect was so convincing that Ross had to keep reminding himself that it was all just a picture. The wolf was dead. Its packmates had fled into the brush, but since the picture remained, Ross decided that the show was not yet over. He could still hear a click of sound, and he waited for the next bit of action. But the reason for his viewing it still eluded him. A man came into view, crossing before Ross. He stooped to examine the dead wolf, catching it by the tail and hoisting its hindquarters off the ground. Comparing the beast's size with the hunter's, Ross saw that he had not been wrong in his estimation of the animal's unusually large dimensions. The man shouted over his shoulder, his words distinct enough, but unintelligible to Ross. The stranger was oddly dressed, too lightly dressed if one judged the climate by the frequent snow patches and the biting cold. A strip of coarse cloth, extending from his armpit to about four inches above the knee, was wound about his body and pulled in at the waist by a belt. The belt, far more ornate than the cumbersome wrapping, was made of many small chains linking metal plates and supporting a long dagger which hung straight in front. The man also wore a round blue cloak, now swept back on his shoulders to free his bare arms, which was fastened by a large pin under his chin. His footgear, which extended above his calves, was made of animal hide, still bearing patches of shaggy hair. His face was beardless, though a shadowy line along his chin suggested that he had not shaved that particular day. A fur cap concealed most of his dark brown hair. Was he an Indian? No, for although the skin was tanned, it was as fair as Ross's under that weathering and his clothing did not resemble any Indian apparel Ross had ever seen. Yet, in spite of his primitive trappings, the man had such an aura of authority, of self-confidence and competence, that it was clear he was top dog in his own section of the world. Soon another man, dressed much like the first, but with a rust-brown cloak, came along pulling behind him two very reluctant donkeys, whose eyes rolled fearfully at the sight of the dead wolf. Both animals wore packs lashed on their backs by ropes of twisted hide. Then another man came along with another brace of donkeys. Finally a fourth man, wearing skins for covering and with a mat of beard on his cheeks and chin appeared. His uncovered head, a bush of uncombed flaxen hair, shone whitish as he knelt beside the dead beast a knife with a dull gray blade in his hand, and set to work skinning the wolf with appreciable skill. Three more pairs of donkeys, all heavily laden, were led past the scene before he finished his task. Finally he rolled the bloody skin into a bundle and gave the flayed body a kick before he ran lightly after the disappearing train of pack animals. End of chapter 1